Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study Genesis chapter 5 and Moses chapter 6. Genesis 5 starts off with this is a book of the generations of Adam. And there's a list of some of the generations of Adam. It's also teaching a wonderful message. Everyone's name has a meaning. And that's Adam's and all these patriarchs. So if you look at Strong's Concordance, and I know different uh, sources have various alterations, a little bit different sub meanings, but here's kind of generally accepted meanings of these names. Adam means man. Seth, substituted, compensation, or put. Enos, mortal. Canaan means nest, possession, or dwelling. Mahael, praiseworthy God. Jared, descent, or come down. Enoch, initiate, or teach. Methuselah, at his extent of time as shooting forth. Literally, it's a man of the dart. Kind of a cool name. I'm a man of the dart. Lamech, meaning lost or despairing. And Noah, quiet, peace, rest. We well, can put that all in a sentence. And it teaches, here is the future gospel of Jesus Christ. All one sentence is, and it's in blue, quote, Man puts on mortality as his dwelling. So the praiseworthy God shall come down to teach that at his fullness of time, the lost may have peace and rest. Or maybe more simply, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching his death, shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. As I compare these two chapters together, it made me have just a question in my mind. Because there's a lot in Moses chapter 6 that's not in Genesis. And I thought, well, if you were Satan, what one thing would you do to cause a lot of confusion, or as much confusion as you could, among the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve? Moses chapter 6 is an illustration of one thing that causes a lot of confusion. Let me show you, better show you, than tell you what I mean. Here's the Pearl of Great Price. Chapter 1, you may note in this picture, most everything is blanked out. What is blanked out is in the book of Moses, but not in Genesis. And as you see, all almost all of chapter 1, it's not in the book of Genesis. But you get to chapter 2, then you have some things that are in Genesis and are also in the book of Moses. Chapter 2, a large part, is in Genesis. But you get to some places like verse 16, you see a little white out there. Yep, there's some things in Moses that is not in Genesis, even though this chapter, most of it is in Genesis. It's in both. And as you go into chapter 3 and 4 and 5, you realize Moses contains a lot more truth. The taking away of truth causes confusion. And then by the time you get to chapter 6, Okay, there's verse 8, and this was the book of generations of Adam. And you have some things in there, but there's also a lot in chapter 6 that's in Moses, but not Genesis. And the same with chapter 7. Taking away these, these simple truths have caused a lot of confusion in the world. So now just focusing on some of the things that are in Moses chapter 6. So we have verse 5. A book of remembrance was kept, in the which was recorded, in the language of Adam, for it was given to as many as called upon God. And I pause there. This isn't just Adam. This is a book of remembrance for anyone who was given to call upon God. If they're praying, if they're worshiping God, they're given by the rest to write by the spirit of inspiration things that they want to keep in remembrance. That is so applicable to us today. President Spencer W. Kimball used this verse as an idea to say we should be keeping a book of remembrance for us to be writing it by the spirit of inspiration. President Spencer W. Kimball said, those who keep a book of remembrance are more likely to keep the Lord in remembrance in their daily lives. Journals are a way of counting our blessings and of leaving an inventory of these blessings for our posterity. More recently, 
Elder Tad R. Collister, said this, quote, Recording spiritual promptings results in at least the following blessings. It preserves the integrity of the message. It preserves the feelings of the moment. It plants spiritual seeds. It facilitates future sharing. It enhances future revelation. So an example of one individual who's done this and who's felt inspiration and recorded it and then kind of gave a process, here's how to get a little more inspiration, is Elder Scott. And he's talked about it several times. Elder Scott taught this. When I'm faced with a very difficult matter, I start reading a passage of Scripture. I ponder what the verse means and pray for inspiration. I then ponder and pray to know if I've captured what all the Lord wants me to do. Often more impressions come with increased understanding of doctrine. I have found that pattern to be a good way to learn from the Scriptures. And I pause right there. For me, reading Revelation invites Revelation. Reading the Revelations in the Scriptures invites Revelation in my heart and my mind. And it often prompts me to do what the Lord would have me do, to understand what the Lord wants me to understand. Now, continuing with Elder Scott. In that environment, strong impressions began to flow to me again. I wrote them down. After each powerful expression was recorded, I pondered the feelings I had received to determine if I had accurately expressed them in writing. As a result, I made a few minor changes to what had been written. Then I studied their meaning and application in my own life. I was then asked to, impressed to ask, Was there yet more to be given? I received further impressions. Again, I was prompted to ask, Is there more I should know? And there was. I had, I had received some of the most precious, specific, personal direction one could hope to obtain in this life. Had I not responded to the first impressions and recorded them, I would not have received the last, most precious guidance. What I have described is not an isolated experience. It embodies several true principles regarding communication from the Lord to His children here on earth. I believe that you can leave the most precious, personal direction of the Spirit unheard because you do not respond to, record, and apply the first promptings that come to you. So maybe that's a great in invitation for each one of us in our lives this week. A simple application. What will you write by the spirit of the inspiration? In whether you call it your book of remembrance, your journal, maybe it's in your just your notes on your phone. But as you're in inspired with something, write it down. Record that moment. It will bless you and I think generations to come. In Moses chapter 6, there's a few themes. And you can see from these verses that there's a common theme throughout all of Moses chapter 6. So verse 1, Adam hearkened on the voice of the God and called upon his sons to repent. Verse 6, and the words written by the spirit of inspiration, their children were taught. Verse 13, and taught his son Enos in the ways of God. And verse 21, and Jared taught Enoch in all the ways of God. And verse 23, and they were preachers of righteousness and spake and prophesied and called upon all men everywhere to repent. And faith was taught in the children of men. And verse 41. And my father taught me in all the ways of God. There is power of teaching righteousness in the home. Faith is most effectively built in the home. And you see that time and time again, Moses chapter 6. A lot of these faithful individuals had that influence of their parents teaching them in the home. President David O. McKay has said, If you would teach faith in God, show faith in Him yourself. If you teach prayer, pray yourself. You would, have, would you have them temperate? Then you yourself refrain from intemperance. If you would have your child live a life of virtue, of self-control, of good report, then set him a worthy example in all these things. More recently, President Gordon B. Hinckley gave this advice to parents. We call upon parents to devote their best efforts to the teaching and rearing of their children in gospel principles which will keep them close to the church. The home is the basis of a righteous life, and no other instrumentality can take its place or fulfill its essential functions in carrying forward this God-given responsibility. And then there's an example of Here's when you have that righteous teaching in the home. Here's what happens. So Enoch is an example of that teaching and how he becomes a great teacher. And as a side note, 
I've had friends, we've often talked about, okay, how does Enoch build a city? A city that's founded on Zion. Zion-like uh, homes and full a city. Well, this is the basis of how he does it. This is what the book of Moses teaches us about it. First, he was taught by his parents in all the ways of God. He had that spiritual foundation in his life. He taught to repent. He was humble. Example, he bowed himself before the Lord. He was God's servant, despite what the weaknesses he saw in himself and what others thought of him. Boy, and there's a lesson just in that verse 31 of how we see ourselves and maybe sometimes we focus on those weaknesses and God maybe says, yeah, I see that too, but I see what you can become and what you can do. With God's help, we can do it. It doesn't really matter what other people think about us. Just keep going with what God has us has a mind for us. Things work out. And then verse 33, he allows other peoples to choose. Quote, choose you this day to serve the Lord, God, who made you. But it's not just, I'm going to let you choose and do whatever. There is, I'm going to allow you to choose, but I'm going to encourage you to choose what is going to bring you happiness and joy. Serve the Lord. Have the Spirit with them. That's a great example of a teacher. He's also bold. Verse 37, cried with a loud voice, testifying against their works. He also walked with God and taught, not essentially what he wanted to have to teach, but what God taught. Enoch is not only an example of, of an effective teacher, but he's also, in fact, an example of an effective missionary. He's taught by his parents. He repented. He was humble. He was God's servant, despite his weaknesses or what he thought of himself and what others thought of him. Effective missionaries allow other people to choose, but they're encouraging them to choose the right. They have the Spirit of God with them. They're bold. Or sweet boldness, I think, is what I was was or what uh, my mission president called it. Walk with God. Effective missionaries teach what God wants to have taught. And as a part of this process for Enoch, verse uh, chapter six, verse thirty-five, and the Lord spake unto Enoch and said unto him, Anoint thine eyes with clay. And we've had a few few times in scriptures where this happens. God says, I'm going to use a little bit of an imagery here to help you understand. And then wash them, and thou shalt see. He does it, an act of faith. And then he has spiritual eyes to see things. He sees things of the Spirit. Now this is verse 36. And he beheld the spirits that God had created. And he beheld also things which were not visible to the natural eye. And from thenceforth came the saying abroad in the land, a seer hath the Lord raised up unto his people. Not just a prophet, but a seer. Elder Johnny Witso taught, a seer is one who sees with spiritual eyes. He perceives the meaning of that which seems obscure to others. Therefore, he is an interpreter and a clarifier of eternal truth. He foresees the future from the past and the present. In short, he is one who sees, who walks in the Lord's light with open eyes. A prophet is a teacher of known truth. A seer is a perceiver of hidden truth. A revelator is a bearer of new truth. And here's what Enoch teaches, because he is a seer. He teaches the fall of Adam. Here's what's happened in the past. And there is a Satan. There is good, there is evil. And God speaks to prophets today. God asks us to do certain things. And then here's kind of a little list. He asks to turn. And this is all in, out of one verse. Turn to him. Hearken, which is listen and obey. Believe and repent. And I pause. One of the things I love about this verse, which isn't taught in very many places, the word repent in Greek means a turning, and changing your heart back to God. But for here, Enoch teaches you need to turn to him first. Just turn a little bit in your direction so you can be listening and paying attention. And then that repentance process seems to act a little bit better in your life. Make covenants. He says baptism. And do all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And you have the promise you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. A lot of basics for us. He also says, ask, be praying in 
the name of Christ so these things can be given to you. And that's the promise. It'll be given. So now I'm just kind of folding all that up under God speaks to his prophets and asks us to come unto Christ. Then there's also Enoch teaches that Christ's atonement covers the fall of Adam. We have our agency. We're agents unto ourselves. And then he says, teach these things freely to your children. And once again, that theme. Got to be teaching it in the home. And then he says there's three elements that you need to understand that are parallels between a physical birth and a spiritual birth. They are three things, water, blood, and the spirit. Elmer McConkie explained it this way, and I love the way he explains it. Two births are essential to salvation. Man cannot be saved without birth into mortality, nor can he return to his heavenly home without a birth into the realm of the spirit. The elements present in a mortal birth and in a spiritual birth are the same. They are water, blood, and spirit. Thus, every mortal birth is a heaven-given reminder to prepare for the second birth. In every mortal birth, the child is immersed in water in the mother's womb. At the appointed time, the spirit enters the body, and blood always flows in the veins of the new person. Likewise, without each of these, there is no life, no birth, no mortality. In every birth into the kingdom of heaven, the newborn babe in Christ is immersed in water. He receives of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, and the blood of Christ cleanses him from all sin. Likewise, without each of these, there is no spirit birth, no newness of life, no hope of eternal life. In verse 63, I love, I think this is probably my favorite verse in all the book of Moses. And behold, all things have their likeness. And all things are created to, and made to bear record of me both things which are temporal and things which are spiritual, things which are in the heavens above, things which are on the earth, things which are in the earth, and things which are under the earth, both above and beneath. Then the summary. we got to understand, all things bear record of me. And I started thinking, okay, all things bear record of me. I'll start making a list. I like making lists. Uh, oh, in the scriptures, there's so many things that bear record of Christ. Light. You just think about the qual properties of light and how it teaches about Jesus Christ. And when he says, I'm the light of the world, even the properties of Christ teach us about him and his mission. Water, bear record of Christ. And Jesus uses water as an example. Whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. There's also just a occupation like a shepherd bears record and teaches us about Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. A rock. That's another imagery that bears record of Christ. So 1 Peter 2, 4, look under the rock from whence you are hewn. He is the living stone, 2 Peter 4. A human 5, 12, build upon the rock. Okay, 5, lamb. A great example that teaches about Jesus Christ. The Son itself. Christ is the Son of God, the Son of righteousness. The life or the way. You could say the path. That's all teaches us about Jesus Christ. And I start thinking, okay, yes, there are sometimes a season where everything around us seems just to remind us of Christ. A star on a Christmas tree, a Christmas tree, a candy cane, bells, wreaths. But then, as I start thinking, what things could I think of? And would they really bear record of Christ? So I thought, what about Thor's hammer? How could Thor's hammer bear record of Christ. But then you think about Thor's hammer and compare it to a testimony. Only Thor can pick it up because he is worthy of it. You get that worthiness in your life, you get a testimony, it's your testimony. You can pick it up. No one else can pick it up. And then, wait, those of you who know things about Marvel, you think, what about Captain America? Captain America got to pick up Thor's hammer well, I thought about that, and then I went to, and I'm getting my notes here, in section 46 of Doctrine and Covenants. To some is given by the Holy Ghost, in verse 14, to know that Jesus is the, is the Son of God, and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. Some people can pick up that hammer all by themselves, but others ask to be given to them. That's verse 14. To others it is given to believe on their words, that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. Or, as Captain America, 
He was worthy. Okay, maybe that's a stretch, but then I started thinking of him. And, okay, and I got the light switch. Okay, that was, I got that light switch. You can make great analogies anytime with light. And then to the left-hand side, the way I'm seeing it, that's soap. I'm thinking, how can soap testify of me? Well, Malachi says the Lord is like fuller's soap. That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. That fuller's soap is a strong alkali soap that's used to remove dirt and oils and other impurities and to bleach and thicken cloth. The process of full, being a fuller involves beating and stomping the cloth with a soapy solution of water. And I thought, okay, that's a lot like, well, like what the Lord does with repentance. There is a process where we got to get it, get, get that dirt out of our life. And Jesus is that soap. But he's even more than that because he cleanses and make it as if the stain was never there. And then I thought, okay, what else? And as I'm thinking about this, I turn the TV on and what well, audio comes out and I'm thinking, what about a speaker? Okay, even a speaker can bear record of Christ. A speaker amplifies the words that are being spoken. And there are things in this life that amplify God's message to me, that help me understand it more clearer, that help it be a little bit more maybe in tune in my life where I can actually hear it better. All things bear record of Christ. And this is just an idea if you're in a family setting. Bring in 10 different things. And just ask with your class or your family, how can they relate to Christ? You'll find in a class that they will have some awesome ideas. And okay, if you're a little bit younger, maybe not some as, as awesome of ideas. You do this in a gospel doctrine class, I bet you they'll come up with brilliant ideas that you've never even thought of. That's what will happen in, in mine when I teach it. Well, I would just encourage you, maybe this is a challenge this week, identify five things every day that to you bear record of Christ. Keep a list. Write it down. Compare it with maybe family members or friends. Here's five things I found that bore record of Christ today. What did you find? I think you'll have a very fruitful and inspiring experience this week. So just a few teaching thoughts on these chapters. Moses chapter 6 is a great example of God's restoration of truths in our day, for which we are very grateful. Effective missionaries teach the words of God that lead to a Zion-like hearts and Zion-like homes. And maybe the idea, like Enoch, how can we be better teachers this week? And I encourage you, look for five things that testify of Christ this week. Keep a list. Share with what you found with your friends and your family, things that bear record of Jesus Christ. I hope you have a lovely week. Keep smiling. Bye.